Cool. Right, so, so thank you everyone for coming along. Tonight we're talking about raising balanced children naturally. And my name's Brenda Rogers. I'm the training manager with Young Living. And it's my absolute pleasure to introduce you to Naomi Dyer, who is one of our goals in Young Living, which means that she knows a hell of a lot about the oils and about children and about how to to get well. So the rest, I'll let you uh, introduce yourself, Naomi. Over to you. Thank you, Brenda. Hello, everybody. And I love that you all started to put in where you're from and your favourite oils. That's something we do every webinar we do with our team. And yes, I can see a few of my team in there. They're all saying hello now. So <laughs> I noticed you're there. That's okay. But thank you um, for joining us tonight, everybody. And I'm glad that there's so many people interested in raising balanced children and doing it as naturally as possible. Now, one thing I do want to point out is I'm not going to sit here tonight and say my children are the most balanced children that you'll ever find because really I don't think that there's anything that anyone could ever do to to have a child 100% perfectly balanced. There's challenges that they come up against daily. There's all sorts of things that go on in their, their worlds. So that's first, just wanted to let you know, I'm not here to say that that you know after this webinar your children will be magically balanced but i'm going to give you some ideas and some tools and lots of statistics because for those of you that know me i'm a green personality <laughs> um but lots of um tools for your wellness toolkit and, and empowered knowledge so that you can go and help your children or children that you know or just have that knowledge that you can use when you're talking to people as well now as per usual I have an obligatory disclaimer, so there you go. Feel free to read on, but uh, it's all the general sort of information. And I want to start by sharing with you what got me into this journey and into all of the research that I do when it comes to children's health and family health and having healthy homes. And it all started with that gorgeous little girl in the middle there. Oh, she's not a little girl anymore. I shouldn't say a young lady now. <laughs> um, that's my eldest daughter, Charlie. And we brand new parents, everything was going swimmingly. She had a little bit of a, a tough start to life, but everything was going swimmingly after that. And then at the age of three, she started to develop all of these symptoms that we had no idea where they were coming from. She was getting pale. She was getting sick. She was getting nausea. She was getting lots and lots of different pains. And, um, you know, from preschool through school, she was even getting sent home from school in agony. Sometimes we'd take her to children's birthday parties and within half an hour, we'd have to leave because she'd be in pain. And we went through every you know medical route that we could because we we, we didn't know any different back then and, and we thought that we'd get a solution but we never did and so ultimately it came to a point where I figured out that I am going to have to empower myself with knowledge and learn as much as I can because I'm the only one at the moment that can do anything about this so I did and I started sort of sitting and figuring that you know if this is starting to come on and it's always her stomach area and it's coming on after she eats it has to be something to do with food so I found this great book called Low to No Additives and it's um, written by a lady called Olivia Dyer. She's no, no relative to us, but it was the thing that really started me on this journey and the thing that really helped us solidify what could possibly be going on. And along the, the way, we found this great naturopath um, and he helped us as well. And basically what was happening was not only were the, the physical symptoms with regards to the food intolerances that she had, but there were such emotional um, imbalances as well. So, and we every now and then we can see it, it's something happening where she might eat something and she's either really sad all of a sudden or you know a little bit hyper, and it, it's it's a food additive related issue. And the the imbalance of the emotions and the moods that was something that we were we struggling to to get you know a, a solution for and this naturopath introduced us to some essential oils that might be able to balance those emotions and help her you know uplift and things like that and the rest is history i guess um so that's where it all started 
And I just thought I'd show you, this is where both my children started. <laughs> they both had little uh, tough starts to their lives. That's uh, Charlie on the left there. She was, I think, 2.5 kilos when she was born and, and little Haley. I oh, know Charlie was 2.3 and Haley was 2.5. She's on the right there. So they both had some, some issues to start with. Haley actually stopped breathing a couple of times on day two. And so she spent quite a, a bit of time in the special care nursery as well. But what, the reason I'm showing you these pictures is I wanted to show you that even though our children can have really tough starts in life, we can empower ourselves, gain knowledge, find solutions and, you know, help them through. And I just wanted to show you where we're at. This, this was actually a couple of years ago now, but both of our girls have realised their first life goals and Charlie's was to represent her country in martial arts. So she did that, um, that was 2015. And Haley's um, first life goal was to meet Gary Young. So there she is there. Now, the reason the top of his head is cut off in that photo <laughs> is because it was one of those moments where we were on uh, the Global Leadership Cruise and I'm just sort of talking to people and moving around the, the area that we were in and all of a sudden I heard, Mummy, look at me. And I turned around <laughs> and she's with Gary and I had to grab the phone to, as quickly as possible to take the photo and I chopped his head off, unfortunately. But we got the photo and then we, she disappeared for a while because he picked her up and walked her around the ship with him. So she was beyond excited. But um, they're both actually now realising another life goal where they're both going to America in June to represent Australia as well. But it's just to show that these little precious little bundles can have really rough starts and have challenges along the way. But things that we can find and solutions that we can find can help them get past them. Now, I wanted to give you some family health statistics and these are for Australia and New Zealand and they can be a little bit shocking. So I wanna start uh, by looking at obesity there. So it's actually the number one national health crisis in Australia. It's actually predicted by 2025 that there'll be one in three children and three in four adults affected. Then we've got um, New Zealand as well, that what the New Zealand health study that was done a few years ago found that in ages 15 years and over, that almost one in three are obese at those age groups and age two and 14 is actually one in nine children obese and one in five overweight. So as you can see, that's a huge issue. Um, diabetes, there it's there's one person diagnosed every five minutes with diabetes. In Australia, we've got 3.6 one million people that actually have diabetes or have pre-diabetes. And New Zealand, um, you've, you've got predominantly type two happening over there with a, around 200,000 people with diabetes and it's increasing in children as well. Um, cancer, one in three men, one in four women will actually be directly affected by the age of 75. And in ages under 15, it's lymphoid, leukemia and brain cancers that dominate there. Heart disease, cardiovascular disease is one of the, you know, the biggest killers that we have out there. There's actually, uh, I think it's one Australian is diagnosed with some heart issues every 10 minutes. Now, children can actually also be affected with um, research done by the um, Heart Research Institute. They recognise that 40% of Australian children show early signs of cardiovascular disease by the time they're 15. Asthma increasing all over the world, one in 10 children, um, oh sorry, one in nine children, one in 10 adults suffer from it in New Zealand. It's one in six adults and one in four children. ADHD continues to rise. It's actually now regarded as a common condition amongst school children. And it's estimated that there's around three to five per 100 children are affected. Um, autism in the early 1980s, it was one in 10,000. These days it's one in 125 in Australia and one in 100 in New Zealand. And mental health, there's around 20% of Australians now showing signs of depression. And some studies, this is really scary information, but some studies have shown that around four in 100 preschoolers actually also show some signs of depression. So there's all sorts of statistics that are on the rise constantly. And it's really, it's, it's, I guess, kind of scary to try and figure out what's happening and where it's coming from. And there's another statistic that actually shows that 72% of our toxic load, so that's, you know, the toxins that we're exposed to, a lot of us think that it's, you know, the, the sprays out in the atmosphere and it's, you know, the car exhaust fumes and the factory fumes and things like that. But there's some studies that actually show that 72% of that can come from your own home.
Now, one more statistic I want to share with you that will, I don't know whether it'll shock a lot of you, but it certainly shocks a few when I do this live. Australians are spending up to 90% of their time indoors. So if 72% of our toxic load is coming from our own homes and we're spending 90% of that time in our homes, it's no wonder that these statistics are increasing if we have homes that have a lot of the, the toxic chemicals and things in them as well. So I wanted to arm you with those statistics so that you've got that behind you when we go through the next section of information as well. So raising balanced children, this is going to mean different things to different people. So I want you to have a think about what that means to you. Now, usually in this modern day, when we have a question, we tend to go to Google. <laughs> so Google usually has all the answers, right? Well, if you want to go and Google raising balanced children, you're going to get about 20,100,000 answers and uh, or responses and places to go to try and find out how to balance your children and they will probably be all grown up and left home by the time that you've tried every one of them so i'm hoping to give you some quick and easy um, ideas tonight during this webinar so let's have a look at some of the issues that children face each day so some of the issues can be behavioral and these are things like tantrums and feeling out of control not listening um, aggression maybe being quite oppositional, fearful, and being, you know, disrespectful and hyperactive. I'm sure that many of you that are parents there can maybe tick one of those or a few of those off that list. And then other issues that children are facing as well can be their learning issues as well. So reading delays and slow processing, comprehension difficulties, um, memory problems, attention issues, sensory issues, and feeling really disorganized. Now, when you marry the behavioral with the learning, that is a lot of pressure on these little precious people. And I didn't want to finish without giving parents um, a little bit of a mention here as well, because Parents, we can have issues too. And sometimes we can feel like we want to throw a tantrum or a little bit out of control or not be listening and maybe feel a little bit of aggression coming on or being oppositional ourselves, fearful, being hyperactive or slow in processing things, have memory problems, attention issues, comprehension difficulties and disorganisation ourselves. So when you think about those, the, the, the emotions that we're feeling, Married up with what the kids are feeling, it can be, you know, this big soup of emotion and stress for people as well. So I really thought about it and I, I, I developed this a few years ago and it's a really easy way that I find to share with people when I do this talk live about building up to that optimum wellness. And when I'm talking about optimum wellness, I'm not saying that if you get every one of these levels right, you are going to have that optimum wellness that is that totally balanced child because as I said, not, not every child has the same um, challenges or the same needs. So it's going to be a little bit different for everybody, but it will be optimum wellness for your child. So when you look at the, the base of my tree, it's nutritional wellness. And when you think about it, the trunk of a tree is one of the most important elements. So when you look at this tree here, as parents and caregivers, if we don't keep that as solid as possible, the tree will probably sway a little bit, it'll feel not balanced and it may topple over. Now, with our children, if we can get the base of this tree working to the best for that child, the rest will follow and hopefully stay balanced as much as possible. Now, we're going to start with the nutritional wellness section. And you know that I like stats. So I want you to get your fingers ready because I want you to have a guess of this. I want you to have a guess at the percentage of children aged five to 15 who don't meet the daily recommended serving of vegetables. All right, so it's a percentage and it's of children aged five to 15 who don't meet the daily recommended serving of vegetables. So write it down or type it into the chat and we'll see how close you are to being correct. So we've got some, some estimates, we've got an 85%, a 60, a 90, a 60, a 75. You're almost there. Let me show you. It's 95% not getting the recommended serving of vegetables. So that is a concern already. And then we look at sugar content, which is on the rise. And I know Brenda is passionate about talking about sugar as well. I remember we did a, a talk together and we kind of 
married up with the with both of us talking about this white sugar. Um, and there was research by Sydney University that was actually published in the British Journal of Nutrition, and that found that sugar is a there's especially bad habits around sugar in children and adolescents. And they found that 76% of teenagers were exceeding the guidelines for daily sugar intake. And their, their research also indicated that in the last 20 years, there has been little to no change in the eating habits of Australians in their consumption of sugar, which is a little bit concerning when there is so much focus on it these days. So I wanted to just have a little bit of a walk through looking at Sugar. Now, as this is a whole other whole other talk that I do on children's health with regards to additives and preservatives, but I thought I'd just bring a little bit of it in because sometimes we don't realise that foods that we perceive that would be the healthiest options may actually have more sugar in them. So when you're looking at the ingredient panels, um, think of when you're looking at the sugar content, one teaspoon of sugar is around four grams. It's, it's somewhere between four and four and a half. So I usually sort of break it back down to four um, to make maths easier for myself. Um, but if you have a look at, say, the, the second from the right there, it's 2.8 teaspoons of sugar in one serving. So in a cup of that, there's 12.8 grams of sugar. Now, if you look a couple over at what would be perceived to be the healthier option, probably on most of those, out of those, 4.6 teaspoons of sugar in that product there. So we really need to get a little bit more um, empowered in looking at ingredient labels as well. And I just want to give you a few more little um, ideas of what are in some of the products around. So if you look at this juice, there are 6.6 .6 teaspoons of sugar in there, same as three tablespoons of Nutella. In this one, there might be some vitamin C in that one. Um, and, you know, we all think, well, I know that I was brought up on that years and years ago, and it was probably a different formula back then anyway. But 6.4 teaspoons of sugar, it's almost the same as what is in that can of soda on the other side. And then we've got sometimes, you know, we make, we think we're making the, the best decisions, but two cherry ripes there are 12.7 teaspoons of sugar and that drink is 13. So it's almost the same. And these juice boxes find themselves in plenty of children's lunch boxes around six teaspoons of sugar in there and, you know, almost the same 6.5 in that, that soft drink there as well. And I just wanted to highlight this because this is something that alarms me whenever we're, we're, as you saw earlier, the girls are heavily into sports and I see this being drunk by children constantly at tournaments. And I even saw uh, a little boy that I believe was about seven the other day drinking the next size up and it was blue. And you kind of have to, to wonder if they realise what's actually in that bottle. So there's a great breakdown of what is in those sorts of drinks as well. And you look at all the sugar, there's eight teaspoons of sugar in that drink. So you need to really know what you're putting on your body, sorry, what you're putting in your body as well. And this, was, this is a great um, graphic as well for you, just to be aware of added sugar. So when you're looking at yogurt, we all think that, you know, it's okay, but you've got to really read those ingredient panels when you're looking at what you're feeding yourself as well as your ch children. One of them has got four teaspoons of sugar per serving. So maybe it might be a better option to look at, you know, than plain, the natural yogurt and just jazzing it up with cinnamon and some berries. We do that all the time and it, it, the, the girls love it. All right, I wanted to finish this little section with showing you this. It always um, is a little bit shocking when we do this one live. And we're, we're just looking at this little boy. We're pretending it's his birthday. He's been taken out to a restaurant um, for his birthday and he's ordered a barbecue pizza. Now, what I'm going to show you is how much sugar you may not realise can be in one meal for children. So looking at this barbecue pizza, he's eaten his, his nine-inch pizza and he's just consumed five and a quarter sugar cubes. Now, down the bottom, you'll see that it says recommended daily maximum sugar for a child of age 7 to 10 is 24 grams or 6 sugar cubes. I don't think there's many of us that would agree with that either, but that's just what they had put as the recommended. Um, and then he's going to have a dessert because it's his birthday, remember? So he's having some ice cream. He's just consumed another 5 cubes of sugar. It has a lemon crunch topping, so there's another 11 and a half cubes of sugar. And some milk chocolate beans on top, and there's another 9.75 um, cubes of sugar 
And because he was really thirsty, because there were so many other additives in that pizza, <laughs> his parents let him have a couple of Pepsis, oh, sorry, a couple of soft drinks, and that's 16 and a half. So in one meal, he's consumed around 48 cubes of sugar. And mum and dad probably didn't even realise because a lot of times we just don't think about the hidden sugar in foods. Now, there's also been in the news lately um, some issues with regards to some of the ways that, that uh, companies rate their products. So there's a health star rating. And you will have seen lately that unfortunately Nestle have had to buckle to pressure and put the correct star rating for their product on. What, what was happening was when you have that product with skim milk, it gives it a four and a half, a four and a half health star rating. Without the skim milk, it goes down to 1.5. So that just shows you as well, you still have to look at the ingredient labels, even if there's something like that on the front of the, um, <clears throat> of the product. All right, now some people have even further challenges that they have to, to watch as well. And you know, there's so many children have food intolerances and food allergies these days. Now a food allergy is a response by the, the body's immune system to a particular food and it kind of interprets it as being toxic to the body. And symptoms can, you know, come on within two hours and they're things like itchiness and rash and swelling. And sometimes it can be so severe that it's life-threatening. I'm sure this, uh, everyone's heard of that and, you know, there's lots of schools that have these initiatives to not have certain foods in the schools as well. Food intolerances are a little bit different in that it doesn't actually specifically involve the immune system. It's basically an adverse reaction to a food. Um, again, the, the symptoms can be unpleasant, but in general, they're not usually life-threatening. Now, statistics show that one in 20 children have food allergies and one in 100 adults. And again, Australia is leading the way. We've got one of the highest allergy rates in the world, and it's a 50% increase since the late 1990s. So I'm sure, like me, a lot of these stats don't sit well with you. What is it about our country and, you know, New Zealand, when I did the health stats, you guys aren't that far behind. Um, what is it about our food that is causing all these issues? And, you know, I guess for us, we all know how much care Gary and the team put into the soil that our plants for our essential oils are grown in. And it kind of baffles me sometimes that I never hear the same about the soils that a lot of our foods are grown in. So maybe that's a, a place to start. But when you do research and you start looking into um, the history and where the, the allergies have been pinpointed in the media as well. This, this has been in my presentation for a good few years now and this dates back to 2011 where they were saying that Australian children have the highest recorded rate of food allergies in the world and they were warning that the statistics could translate into a wave of chronic diseases. That was back in 2011 and the statistics are still increasing. Again, number of children hospitalised with potentially fatal food allergies is on the rise, new research finds in 2015, but we're still on the increase. So even though we're more aware of it, these, these issues are still increasing. Now, everybody knows, and I know Brenda knows, she's seen it as well, that the, I could talk for hours on food colourings and food additives and food preservatives. So I just thought I would talk about one here tonight so that you're not all with me until midnight. Um, but there's a whole lot of additives and preservatives that I discovered along the way that we really had to eradicate from our homes. And I thought that we ate pretty, um, pretty well. And I thought I was feeding my children pretty well, but it was a lot of the hidden things and the, and the numbers and the words that I didn't understand on the ingredient listings that were the problem for us. Now, since 2010, across um, Europe, it's been mandatory that a warning label is actually included on all food packaging and that it states if there's any um, artificial colours in there <clears throat> that relate to a report that was called the Southampton Six. And that was a study um, that researchers at the University of Southampton did and they found that there were some colours that were actually increasing levels of hyperactivity in young children. So the, the Southampton Six, as they're known, are numbers 102, 104, 110, 122, 124, and 129. So they're known as the Southampton Six. Now, for us, Australian food authorities haven't actually yet restricted the use of these artificial food additives. 
there's actually around 350 food additives allowed in Australia and New Zealand and there's about 50 of them that you can find a lot of research on that are causing, uh, I guess, health-related concerns to experts. So we still have these available in our food, so that's why we need to be really clued up on what some of the numbers are. And again, the companies are getting wise to the fact that a lot of us parents know the numbers now, so they're putting the wording on there. And the wording is so difficult to remember. So it gets to a point where I now look at a label, and if, I, if my children couldn't understand the ingredients that are on there, then I just don't get that product or if it's you know food that has ingredients that i wouldn't normally have in my pantry it doesn't come into my home um reformulations of their own products as well and this is one company that did that they saw that that study and so they've started um reformulating some of their products as well so some companies are coming up to speed and you know helping us out but nutrition uh, is really important for all children. And, you know, when, when a child's blood sugar goes down and, you know, they're, they're feeling hungry and confused and, and grumpy and sweaty and shaky, they really don't have enough energy to learn and to, you know, to have energy to move around as well. So breakfast is one of the most important meals of the day. I know we've all heard that over and over again. And I wanted to give you some information on breakfast and I've put the references down there for those of you that like to look things up as well. But what I found is that one in six school children skip breakfast. And this can leave them, I guess, tired in class. It can, you know, lead them to being disruptive in class. And according to various reports, the reasons that were given from parents, uh, there were 52% of parents actually said that it was because they had no time. And 44% of them said that it was because their children didn't like breakfast. Now, some of the other studies that have been done have actually shown that there were other reasons as well. And some were reported that, or reported that it was, um, a method of weight control, and then others reported that the children were modelling behaviour after their mum or their dad or their friends at school who they perceived as not having breakfast either. And, you know, when you look through research, it all shows that a nutritious breakfast can help improve concentration levels, the physical performance, positive moods and energy, and it's important for their, you know, their intake of vitamins, minerals and dietary fibre. So breakfast is really important. And what works for us are these things. So wolfberries, they're great to put in, you know, granolas and things like that. Obviously, we've got Gary's granola now, which is amazing. We go through a lot of that in this house. <laughs> but things like eggs, spinach, tomatoes, we have yogurt, we have fruit. We make um, yummy pancakes, healthy pancakes as well and smoothies. And I often um, get asked by people, well, how do you have time to do things like eggs, spinach and tomatoes in the mornings? And it's as simple as while you're making your child's lunch, have the pan on the cooktop and just throw in some eggs, throw in some cut up tomatoes, maybe throw in some spinach and let that sit there cooking, stir it every now and then while you're making their lunch. And by the time you've made their lunch, there's a healthy breakfast sitting there for them as well because it really doesn't need a lot of attention. So it can be as simple as that. Um, as I said, Ninja wolfberries are really important in our house and whether it's the berries or whether it's in the way of Ninja red, if the children, you know, the girls don't want to have Ninja red first thing before they go to school, they'll, they'll take it with them in a sachet. And we quite often will have the frozen sachets in the freezer so that A, it cools down their lunchbox, but by recess, especially the youngest one, she's got a slushy to have at recess. So that's a pretty special thing as well. So Ningxia red and wolfberries are really important in our house as well. And smoothies, I can't tell you if you've got tweens or teens, smoothies can be the greatest things because they like to make them themselves as well. So then they've made breakfast too. So I know um, Charlie, for instance, sometimes because she starts uh, school an hour earlier, sometimes she just isn't ready in time to sit down to a bigger breakfast. So she will pop a, a smoothie um, and we call it take the shake. So if she doesn't have time to drink it, straight at home, then we'll take it with us on the way to school. But she likes to put balance completing hers with some fruit sometimes. And um, Haley, my youngest, is actually discovering smoothies now. So she likes to make her special one, which has got banana. It's got a bit of honey in there as well. So really easy and quick and nutritious way that you can get your children 
um, some breakfast happening as well. All right, so let's move on to nutri to sorry emotional wellness. So I think we're pretty cool with the nutritional wellness. We've got that happening now, and the next step up is looking into their emotional wellness as well. So these poor little cherubs go through all sorts of emotions daily, whether it's their own frustration at themselves, maybe their self-esteem has taken a plummet, maybe they're getting bullied at school and, you know, children are talking about them. It may be for the older ones, the, the pressure from, you know, some of them go from, you know, year six where it's just a little bit of homework to a lot of homework and assessments in high school and some of them you know might have some pressure from home hearing parents argue or issues that are happening at home so there's lots of different places that emotions are being played with from different directions so some practical ways that we can help them and you know they're really easy things that a lot of us will probably know already but sometimes it's nice to have a reminder and you know one of them is just to love them show them consistency in love and security and that really builds on that self-esteem and sometimes it's challenging them encouraging them but listening to them at the same time being not non-judgmental and you know listening in that way and understanding and reasonable limits children need limits as well so that you know can display for them that there are boundaries that they just can't cross and looking at them, really important. Eye contact is one of the single most important ways to really emotionally connect and show them that you're truly with them. My girls will often walk home and I'm still sitting in my office doing something that, that I'm trying to get finished before they get home. And I find myself every now and then just sort of looking at them, looking back at the sky, and then I have to stop myself and go, no, that's, that's not right. So I'll then move away and actually sit and make sure that I make that eye contact. And help them identify feelings helping them learn to recognize and express all the different sorts of feelings that they they um, develop it kind of helps them to sh show them that it's, it, it is okay to be themselves you know I've got a particularly sensitive child and throughout some of her schooling we've been told by teachers that you know you, she needs to be made to be more resilient she needs to be made to be this and I just sort of look at them and go but the world needs sensitive people as well and I'm not going to make her be something, but I'll help her learn to identify her feelings. And inhaling an aroma can help as well. Scents, as we most of us know, are powerful because that simple smell can really, can immediately trigger memories and memories of people and memories of places. Um, they have the power to evoke different emotions as well. And that, you know, that all comes down to working within the brain and the different signals that go to the brain and working in with the limbic system and the amygdala where, you know, they're particularly in charge of emotions and moods and memories. And the amygdala in particular is working incredibly hard, especially during the teenage years to stabilise itself. And, you know, these systems the two of them are also in charge of regulating that fight or flight. And that's something that our children can sometimes need help in learning how to manage as well. So I wanted to give you some of my top mood management oils. So this is for the moods when the children are just feeling extremely cranky right now and they've got that little face on and they're just really about to, you know, to blow. Um, so release is a great oil. Um, sacred mountain that is one of the best now what I want you all to do as well is each slide that I come up with the mood management if you've got some that you found that work really well pop them in there because we all love to share so make sure that you type some in there that I might not have included on the slide lavender is great for children when they're feeling really really cranky and valor you're going to see that valor is going to be one of the best oils that you can have for mood management and tranquil as well that's a really good one for when they're feeling really really cranky and then we've got the children that are just feeling like I'm a very tight ball and I'm about to burst and you are annoying me and they're trying to hold everything in and one more little noise is probably going to make that that whole thing burst and oils like surrender and peace and calming I can't tell you how many people have peace and calming in their homes and find it one of the best oils to have around for mood management. Frankincense, beautiful, spiritual, calming oil. Orange, 
children really relate to orange and it kind of invokes that feeling of it's okay to be a kid because especially when they're growing up and they're getting older and they've got the pressures of the extra school and friends and that sort of thing sometimes orange will just take them back to feeling like that little child again there's our friend valor once more and stress away stress away is a great one uh, to use with those emotions as well and then we've got when everything's just feeling dark and sad and nothing's going right and they're just in that really ugh, mood where you, there's nothing you can say that's going to make them feel any better. Um, so having something like present time uh, or lemon. Lemon's really uplifting and beautiful as well. Joy is another great one. And orange, again, orange is useful in mood management in so many aspects. And again, we can't go without our valour. So you can see that Valor is going to be one of the best oils for you to have around for mood management. And then we've got when children are feeling scared, like really, really scared, there's a monster under the bed type scared. So there's a few that you can use. And those of you that have seen me live know I like to uh, teach people how to make a monster spray for the monsters under the bed or a bad dream spray. And that's basically a spray bottle with water with lavender in it. Uh, but other oils that you can use are things like white angelica. And I've seen a couple of you have mentioned white angelica uh, there already. Trauma life, valor again, lavender, Roman chamomile. That's one of the, the most beautiful oils to use in this instance as well. And again, stress away. So you can see that there's a few that are doubling up for different emotions so that your wellness or your emotional toolkit can have one oil that's going to suit a few different emotions. And I can't go past the mood management section without mentioning the teenagers. So... When we're talking about teen girls, yes, I know, I have dragon time four times over on that slide because I wanted to emphasise how really important dragon time can be at this stage. So dragon time is a great oil to have around for the teen girls because they're usually standing there going, I'm over this, everyone hates me, I don't, don't like anyone, I don't even know why I'm crying. So dragon time can be a great one for them. Again, there's valour. What we've discovered too in our house is that the stress away bath bombs are very popular with our teen and she just loves popping one of those into the bath. And one, one tip as being a parent of a teen, if for some reason you can't get any of those to calm them down, have one of these somewhere in the back of the cupboard because I tell you if you give a teen girl any sort of Savvy Minerals makeup, they forget anything and everything about the mood that they were in. So <laughs> I found that that's a really good mood management tool as well. And the boys. Now, I don't have teen boys, so I have my information from some of my team that do. And apparently that you can be met with complete silence or a grumpy face or even grunting answers. So one of the best oils for them is Mr. And I can tell you it's really great for the slightly older boys as well. So the men in the house, <laughs> make sure that you have some mister happening as well. All right, we're going to move up the tree one more step and we're going to look at physical wellness as well. Now, with physical wellness, there's two main areas to think about. And the first one is obviously physical activity and that sport and being active. And then there's their physical environment. So looking at some of the nasty toxins that might be in some of the products that we have around the house, such as household cleaners and shampoos and shower gels and things like that. Now, according to um, the source raising children, it's really essential for healthy growth and development that children participate in physical activity because it helps you know, with strong bones and muscles, it helps them have a healthy heart, um, improves their coordination and their balance, and it helps them really to sleep well, to be relaxed, to concentrate better at school, and to get along with others as well because sometimes you know, they're team sports. And with the little ones, it also helps them learn to share and take turns and cooperate um, and, and feel like they belong to something as well. Now, I did some research uh, when I put this together and according to the Australian guidelines, it's recommended that at age zero to one, babies have some form of floor play every day. <coughs> Excuse me. From the ages one to five, it actually says that they should be physically active for at least 
three hours per day, but spread over the day, not, not like a three hour walk. We're talking different sorts of activity for three hours during that day. And for ages five to 18, they recommend that there's at least one hour of moderate to vigorous physical activity each day. Now the moderate is uh, activities that get your child sort of gently huffing and puffing, so maybe a quick walk. And vigorous is where they're really huffing and puffing a lot or really sweating. So they're things like running games or riding a bike really fast. And when we're looking at a toxic environment, we kind of know a lot about chemicals these days because it is out there, but things like lead, mercury, arsenic, pesticides and solvents, they're really um, those sorts of toxins that can interrupt their healthy brains. And there's chemicals under investigations as well, such as BPA and food additives and fluoride. So when we look at the numbers relating to these sorts of chemicals, the European Chemicals Agency estimates that there are more than 144,000 man-made chemicals in existence. And the US Department of Health uh, states that there's around 2,000 new chemicals that are being released each year. Now, when you uh, look at the UN Environment Program, they actually warn that most of these have never actually been screened for human health uh, safety. And what they're finding as well is that industrial toxins are now routinely found in newborn babies, in mother's milk, in the food chain, and in domestic drinking water worldwide. So that's a little bit alarming. Now, what I want you to do is have a look at the next picture. And let's think about majority of the toxic laden um, pr uh, products such as the cleaners and the you know the <clears throat> the personal care products and things like that a lot of their ingredients are created here so when we look at this picture this is picture a and i'm about to show you picture b have a think about where you're more comfortable with the ingredients coming from so this is ingredients coming from here or ingredients coming from here and I'm pretty sure that you will all agree that that is probably your preferred option now I love this photo because this was my very first time at the I think that's the Mona farm in Utah and um, Hayley you can see is a little bit younger than she is now and I remember that was quite an emotional experience for me because I sat there thinking that I am now in the lavender fields where the lavender was grown that was in the bottle that I just applied to you half an hour before we got here. And so for me, going through everything I had with personal care products and food additives and things, that we, the issues we'd had with Charlie, I was so um, just taken aback that I was now able to see where ingredients were coming from and grown that were in the products that we were now using. So I just thought I would quickly share with you um, what we do in our house now and the products that we use. So we're, this is low tox living our way. And I can honestly tell you that every single product in that picture, <coughs> excuse me, we use <laughs> and we use constantly. There's, you know, these household cleaners, I've got so many bottles of that around the house. The dish soap is used every single day. The sprays, the mouthwashes, the, to the toothpaste, the foaming hand soap. I'm sure most of you have discovered that by now. That is unbelievable. But what an amazing way to be able to introduce somebody to living the way that we do. And that's our Healthy Homes PSK. And that's an amazing pack to be able to share with people. But to know that I can, you know, even with that kit, I can mood manage because there's oils in there that I mentioned earlier that we can use for mood management as well as cleaning and all of the, the personal care products. And I don't need to read the ingredient labels anymore. So I'm saving so much time uh, compared to what I used to do with having to research and read all these ingredient labels. And I'm saving so much money because as you know, these products, because they're such top quality, we don't yet need to use anywhere near as much as the products we used to use. I don't anymore have to worry about you finding flavour enhancers in our food. And that was one thing I didn't know a lot about when I first started on this journey. I didn't realise how they sneak into different products and sauces and things that you can cook with. So what I have in my kitchen now are Mother Nature's flavour enhancers. <laughs> so we use the culinary oils and we use the Young Living Cookbook all the time to make our meals from because we know that they're going to be healthy and nutritious meals and that what we're flavoring them with is mother nature in our kitchen 
and we have our kids products as well and what I particularly wanted to highlight with this slide is that when you think about it we are all participating in creating a really beautiful low-tox future starting from the youngest because now we have that incredible seedlings range and then we move them up to the kids sense range and then we move them up to the regular products so we are starting a low-tox I, I guess movement and revolution with our products now starting at babies so I think that we should be so incredibly grateful to Young Living and you know Gary and the team for providing us with this way of changing the world so I wanted to show you as well that you can have amazing products for the teens as well because we were talking about children and teens and for us I know my daughter you my, well, both my girls use the art skincare we go through a lot with the Savvy Minerals. She just, Charlie just loves the Savvy Minerals. So she's got every sort of product in the range and she plays with them and she's teaching me things like foiling and baking and all sorts of things. So I know now that there are going to be so many mums because we were always concerned about the fact that when they discover makeup, the only makeup that was around had was so full of nasty toxic chemicals in there. Now we've got this range and we're going to have so many mums that are going to be so much more comfortable because the colours are subtle as well for the, for the children, for the girls. And then there's, you know, the teen boys, there's bar soap, they start shaving eventually. So there's all these beautiful products for them as well. And then we move to the final little part of our tree, which is spiritual wellness. And this is really, really important. And it does mean different things to different people. So you may have religious beliefs, you may have spiritual beliefs. And I love this quote uh, from Deepak Chopra. And he says that every child should feel that they are loved and lovable, that they are worthwhile in their parents' eyes, and that being a good person comes from within, and happiness and fulfillment are natural. And I just think that they're just beautiful words and, and, you know, there's so many beautiful ways that we can help children with their spiritual wellness these days. And one of the best is meditation. Now, there was actually a study that was performed at the National Therapies Research Unit at the Royal Hospital uh, for Women in Sydney. And that showed a significant improvement in ADHD symptoms with children who were taught to meditate. The children actually reported that they had improved attention and they felt a lot less um, hyperactive. And other uh, side effects that the parents actually reported were that there were improved relationships between them and their children and that their children looked like they had a, or felt like they had a better se uh, sense of self-esteem as well. Now, another quote from Deepak Chopra, he states that exposing our children to these ancient yet practical techniques could help them to cope better with stress and grow into living healthier lives. So different um, little techniques that you can use to start getting them meditating. And I remember when we started with Charlie a few years ago, it was really interesting to me that um, <coughs> I kind of got her to lie down. We had, you know, we were in the nice relaxed position, but I was watching her and her hands just couldn't relax. They were constantly moving and it took a fair while to get her to relax. So I, that for me was an indication of how tense her little body was back then. Um, but some ideas, you know, become the change yourself. Let them see you doing these, these things and, and meditating and let them see that, you know, if mum and dad or caregivers are doing it, that, that I can do that too. Practice silence. That's it. Maybe have a, a certain period of time. Maybe start with, you know, five minutes and 10 minutes, 15 minutes where it's silent time. And I have to tell you, I went, my husband gifted me a weekend meditation retreat at um, the temple in Wollongong. And I didn't realize that as soon as we arrived, they put a badge on you that said noble silence. And that was it. You're not allowed to speak. And I was sitting there thinking, I'm never going to last a weekend with this. But I have to tell you, it was amazing. I absolutely loved it. Even when we were eating together, no one was allowed to talk to each other. It was amazing. Um, with meditation, start short and simple. And maybe you could do it through yoga as well. I know, I'm sure Brenda um, can maybe talk to us at the end a little bit about yoga for children. Visualisation could be an idea. Massage. If you can't get them to sit still long enough, maybe give them a bit of a massage. And you could also look at making a special meditation space together. Make them feel part of that. Um, and one thing that I love is this. It's the Ananda Kids um, app. 
and it's by Deepak Chopra's um, group. And the two that you can see on the screen, it's called My Light Shines Bright and Nature's Playground. They're actually free. So you can download it and have those two meditations for free. If you want more, you have to pay, but we've, we've only ever used those two. And it's a great way to get the children to just sort of sit and have some quiet time with some beautiful music and some guided meditations there as well. And when we want to, we have the most amazing essential oils to use when we're meditating as well. So here's some of the favourites. I took um, some information from some people in my team that, um, that do a lot of meditating, things that I found that I like to diffuse when I'm meditating as well. We have so many. I couldn't fit <laughs> enough of them on the screen. But some of the favourites that I found were Abundance, Awaken and incidentally that oil is my daughter my eldest daughter's favorite. She absolutely loves awaken So that could be another one to add to your list for teens as well Believe another beautiful oil clarity clarity was actually my first ever oil um, And that that was I still every time I smell it. It brings me back to the day that I joined young living frankincense again Frankincense, and I know sacred frankincense down the bottom. I've got people in my team that absolutely swear by those two, you know, especially sacred frankincense. Gathering, harmony, humility, inspiration, present time and release, absolutely beautiful oils, and you would have seen those that were in the mood management section as well. Sacred mountains, surrender, white angelica. So really when you look at, you know, the ideas for tools to have in your wellness toolkit, you can actually see now that there's a whole lot in this meditation section that were in the mood management section as well. So, so many of our oils we can use all the way through looking after, you know, our children and getting them to the top of that, that tree of success as well. So there you go. Once you really hone in on the nutritional wellness, then you start working towards the emotional wellness, the physical wellness, the spiritual wellness. You can then sort of look at the fact that you are pretty much at the optimum wellness for your child. And I always suggest to people, don't sit and look at this and go, okay, I've got to do that one, that one, that one, and that one all at once. Maybe just focus on one at a time. Maybe focus for, you know, the next month on the nutritional wellness section and make sure that you've got a good grasp on that and everything's running smoothly with that and then add in the emotional wellness and some ideas from that and get that happening really well and then add in the physical wellness and then add in the spiritual and do it piece by piece because I think, you know, if you, if you think bigger issues in each one of those sections and you're going to try and do it all at once, you'll be quickly become overwhelmed and you won't, you know, do each section as best as you possibly can. So with that, I thank you so much for joining me in this webinar um, and I hope that you took some information down and that you've got some ideas, if not for children, maybe for yourself as well. And um, if you want to contact me, there you go. That's You can be my friend on Facebook and all of that sort of thing. But I am going to uh, pass back over to Brenda. Ah, Awesome. Naomi, I've had texts on my phone from people saying, oh, Naomi's great, this presentation is fantastic. So, so a couple of things that really stood out for me and I'd love it if the guys listening could type into the chat their take-homes and their key ahas from today because I can um, copy those uh, at a later time and upload it as feedback or when we post this to the Facebook page, I can add some of the comments that you've made. So please, please write in some of your um, take-home uh, comments from today. But for me, it was the 72% of the toxic load coming from our, our home. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> That's, some of that we can do something about and some of that we can't. I know you know that, Naomi, but yes, stuff that yeah. comes out of carpets and out of paint and all that kind of stuff, we, we really want to be having some nice oils diffusing to sort of minimise some of that. But, um, but certainly the things that we can control, we really, really ought to do something about, uh, and I'm sure you'd agree with that too. But also that, and this I kind of have known a little bit, but this statistic is more shocking than, than I thought, and that's, the five to fifteen year olds not getting any not getting any veggies. I mean, five percent. That's just it's just ridiculous <laughs> um, and very sad because, as we know, the uh, eating more vegetables is the answer to everything, really, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Um, 
I laughed that you said that the teens just the teen girls just need a lip gloss or a, or a savvy product. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, That's thinking outside the box. Sometimes we need an extra tool in our toolkit. It yeah, really is great. It's really, really, really great advice. I think um, somebody said great idea in the text box as well. Um, uh, a couple of comments in the text box made me think about uh, your your comments about kids being, um, you know, anxious or whatever. Somebody post post in the text box that the um, their heads are full, and I wonder if technology has something to do with that. And 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 you know, right up to the last minute before bed, they're still watching their iPad or their phone or or something. And so that's maybe something that in the future we need to. Yes, there's lots of research on that as well. It's a, a huge issue. Yeah, not to, me- not to mention the electromagnetic frequencies. Yes. But um, a couple of things I thought I'd just mention in addition to all that beautiful information that you've given and all those hints and tips, and meditation was particularly powerful. I think that's just one of the, the most simplest, most beautiful things that we can, we can offer. But I would also like to suggest to our audience that the, the raindrop training for family and friends that we do here from the office around the country so one day training is extraordinary for uh you know giving ourselves a skill and a tool to be able to work on relaxing children or supporting them with touch or in some way just relieving uh, making them feel safe and comfortable and and it's a great tool so i'd like to encourage everyone to just to, to get along to one of those trainings when they get the opportunity because they can be amazing Uh, And also, as I mentioned uh, before we started recording, just for those of us, those of you who are listening to this recording and for those who are on the call itself, if you're listening before July 2018, uh, we do have the balance retreats coming up where um, the kids can't come along, but the parents can come along and learn a little bit more about that yoga that you talked about Um, and also meditation and ways to balance yourself in your everyday life so please keep an eye out for that as well so that's it for me thank you so much naomi and as always really i love that you're green <laughs> <laughs> and i love that your branding and your name and your everything's green it all um, just fit together <laughs> very together and very consistent so we do appreciate the beautiful slides and the research, amazing amount of research that you've done and your willingness to share so generously with us. So thank you so much, Naomi. Thank you everyone in the audience and good night.